that was the worst DIY I've ever seen in my life. Some of the stuff there, but for landlords, I walk enough of them or there's, and this is the other problem in these days, there's a lot of new landlords, like everybody Mm -hmm. in, in America seems to be a real estate investor these days. There's a lot of new landlords that they go and hire a contractor and don't realize that the contractor just screwed them yeah. and used really terrible materials, didn't install them properly. And weird, after six months, it's falling apart. All right, guys. Welcome nice. to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast. With our uh, new intro there. That is badass. I think it's cool. I feel like it's a little bit too long. We'll uh we'll keep working on it. Like we'll tighten it up. We sat there and stared at each other awkwardly long as that was playing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh we'll uh always evolving, always adapting our show and our brand here. So if you thought that sucked, shoot us a message. I'll do it again. But anyways, if it is your first time here, welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast, where I, Mike DeHaan, and my co-host, the big BDE, Big Dan Energy over here talk about real estate investing, business, and whatever else is on Dan's mind that week because uh, you tend to stray from the path a little bit more we, than I do with you. Are we going to drop some BDE? Like, is that coming or what? Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually a good bookkeeping thing to start. So if you don't know what BDE is, it is something that Dan coined off the top of his head like two months ago. Randomly. It's stuck. Coming in with his big Dan energy and we're having some shirts made and those will be available on the official Collecting Keys store. Coming up here, actually, by the time this show airs, that should be out and alive. So it should be at store.collectingkeyspodcast.com. You will be able to get some Collecting Keys merch. We have our Collecting Keys podcast logo shirts. We're going to have our BDE t-shirts. And as we create some more inside jokes, they'll show up on there too. Well, as our our designer and our editor listens to stuff (laughs) and thinks things are funny. And even if you don't think they're funny, we do. And it's our store. So we do what we want. Boom. So store.collectingkeyspodcast.com. You should go check that out. And uh, just so you know, we don't really make any money on these shirts. So they're like, this is literally just for fans. And uh, it's just for fun. It's just for fun. We'll be like the biggest buyers of, us, <laughs> of our own dumb shit. Honestly, for people that we said and stuff to for th- doing things like leaving us a five-star review and other stuff. Anyway, store.collectingkeyspodcast.com. And you should go check out our new Collecting Keys merch. It'll be available for everybody. But anyway, we have had a pretty cool week because something has happened that I'm very excited about. So I guess backtracking a little bit, one of my goals with entrepreneurship and starting this business has always been to have the four-hour work week sort of lifestyle. Not necessarily in the way that I don't have to work, but more just in the digital, you know, location independent style, the digital nomads or style. Even though I'm not a nomad, I stay in my house most of the time. But I like to have the freedom to travel and to do things. And as a result, we built this business with the virtual style business in mind, a lot of virtual systems in place to give that, like I have now personally signed for deals in four different continents. Dan, you have not had the luxury yet because you got small kids, but you'll get there. But um, we built the system out to run this business this way. And we just had our first staff member sign a couple of deals while internationally traveling, super cool. which I think is super awesome. So, you know, people that come and work for us, we're not a button seat company. You have your roles and responsibilities that you need to get done. And if you do that, I don't care where you are. You know, I don't care if you're at your house or if you're, you know, over in New Zealand where one of our guys is at. And he had some sellers reach out that he'd been conversing to. He got on the phone with them from across the world, got things signed around. And like he has two contracts that he's now gotten signed while uh, like overseas, which is super sick. One in Maine, one in Detroit. And uh, yeah, he's making some money. We're making some money. And he's able to travel and go visit his family and do all the stuff that he wants to do. So So we're able to buy houses anywhere in the world while we're anywhere in the world. Well, That's what you just said. I mean, that's kind of crazy to think about. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know if we can buy houses anywhere in the world because there's lots of different (laughs) rules and restrictions in different countries. true. (laughs) We could tell people we're going to buy houses in all sorts of other places, but, you know. I mean, we could. That's kind of like a thing right now is people going to Mexico and Portugal to try and buy these assets. But what makes that tricky, a lot of people don't realize this, is the 30-year fixed amortized mortgage that we have in the United States is extremely unique. Most markets don't have that. I mean, even if you go up to Canada, Canada has like a 10-year balloon on all their mortgages that makes you do an adjustment at that point, which is pretty interesting. But then there's other places that have the opposite. So I believe Japan and Switzerland 
They actually have what they call like legacy mortgages, which are 50 years. Multi-generational. Yeah, they're supposedly multi-generational mortgages that you can get. There's a lot of countries that have like three-year adjustable rates, like that's all you can get. So, you know, in phases yeah. like this last little bit, you locked up your sick interest rate in 2021, that's super low. And, you know, in the United States, everyone's celebrating. You go to some of these like European countries, well, enjoy it while it lasts because you're all going to be forced to adjust here next year. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, I think it speaks a lot to affordability too and how a lot of other countries, it is not very affordable and a lot of people buy apartments, uh-huh. like units, what we would call a condo. That's more of the style of living in the metropolitan areas. It is. They don't have as much suburbs like the U.S. has because of the 30-year mortgage, which in turn has helped drive the economy massively over the over decades of time. Yeah. I mean, construction and housing is a major part of the of our economy. It is. I mean, that, but also, too, it's a huge wealth generator for people. You know, they, they get into a home. Like, folks like the Dave Ramseys and the Ramit Satis out there, like these people that are super anti-homeowner, they pretend like this isn't a real thing. But the homeowner, you know, you get into a home, you pay down a mortgage to the fixed rate debt, you're building equity in that asset, that leads to a significantly higher net worth over the course of your, you know, your life, right? And like a lot of that gets overlooked. People talk about maintenance and all these sort of things. But if you look at the history of real estate values in the United States, it is undoubtedly true that people that have bought homes over the course of like the last, you know, 100 years, they are significantly better off financially. If they are the average person, they're not an entrepreneur, they're not doing something else that's super high income, then just like everybody else who's who's still renting, it's very, very important for our economy and for people's you know financial growth. But yeah, I was going to add to that. The only way that that functions is as long as our population continues to grow, which other major players are seeing that fall off like China, their population growth is actually shrinking. So if you're reducing the amount of people that need to buy houses from the people that had houses the generation before. Now you have a bunch of vacant houses if you're not continuously growing your population, which is also how our economy works. The GDP gross domestic product is measured in how much more did we produce and sell to the world? Yeah. It's kind of a weird thought. Well, I mean, the other thing in China, though, because they overproduced houses, as well as having the declining population. Like, that's why, have you seen the videos of them, like, knocking down all these empty apartment complexes that they have built? Right. Yeah. I, and I don't even know what their real estate market's doing. I'm just saying the idea is if you have a declining population, Japan is the same way and their economy has been in like, tr- like technically in a uh, recession for years. <laughs> like, right. It's just like they're not growing. Yeah. Because they're dying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with, yeah, with China, ultimately what it comes down to is nobody knows what the hell is going on over there. Nobody that, knows. <laughs> nobody knows the truth. Right? Even like the, the experts that work for the federal government, they might know a little bit more than everybody else. But China it does a very good job of making sure that no one really knows. You can have it's chaos. So you just can't. You can it out. have a lot of assumptions. You know, it's a huge country. They'll just go like, yeah, we'll just push things a little bit farther back. So, you know, you can't like see it from where you normally, right. you know, we're viewing from. And that's why they have like those concentration camps out in the, the Gober Desert where they're putting all the, the Iger Muslims, right? I did not know that. You didn't even know that. See, most people don't even know that. You can go and you can find some general footage that has been like smuggled out of the country and they have like literal concentration camps that look like more modern versions of World War II concentration camps. And they are just marching, marching these people around. They have like the jumpsuits, they have like the shaped head. They are completely dehumanizing the Igor Muslim population over there. And most people don't even know about that, right? Because China does not want you to know. I do know that they have like, well, they have prisons and farms for organs. Yeah. So they have a huge organ market, like human Uh body organ market over there. And I wonder if that's why, if that's part of it too, where they're like, but they literally have like people and they're like, oh, you need a heart for a blood type this for this body. Cool. We got that in this jail cell. We're going to go cut it out right now. Yeah. I mean, you're not wrong. Wow. The stuff that they do is insane regarding their human rights issues, right? (laughs) But what human rights? Yeah. So even, even the way that they're getting into different countries. So when me and Madison, my, my wife, we traveled around the, uh, southern African region for most of September last year. We went to Namibia, which was a part of South Africa until like the 90s. Um, then they got independence and they were a very, I would say like they weren't super developed country. They had been the kind of forgotten parts, a super arid area. It's actually, I think by by size, it's the largest arid country in the world. I might be wrong oh. on that. Um, but like, so it's where they filmed like Mad Max there. Like it's like these insane. A lot of sand dunes and deserty. Yeah, yeah, sand dunes, but it's extraordinarily rich in like heavy metals. 
And to the point that when it first got colonized by the Germans, what the Germans would do is they would have their slaves, right? That would go out there and they would crawl through the sand and they would find diamonds, like not even kidding. That was their mining tactic was they would have their people that were like shoulder to shoulder and they would crawl through the sand and they would find diamonds, which is insane. But anyway, the Chinese to like, they want access to these resources. Of course. Namibia declared independence. The Chinese came swooping in and were like, hey, your country kind of sucks. What if we came and we, we'll so, yeah. so exactly what they said. That is, that is by quote in the Namibian history book, the Chinese ambassador said, hey, your country's, your country's shit. Can we come and build your entire infrastructure for you? We will build a modern electrical system, modern roads, modern plumbing, modern everything. We will do it for you absolutely for free. You just have to give us the rights to all of your natural resources. And they were like, hell yeah, we just gave middle finger to South Africa. Let's do it. Right. And they took it. So now they have this whole infrastructure being built by the Chinese. But the Chinese are crafty because not only are they getting all these resources, they have also now used the workforce they're sending over there. You know who they're sending? All of their convicts and felons oh, and people nice. that they don't want in their country. They are shipping Perfect. them over to Namibia to build all stuff. And they're like, yep, you just live in Africa now. See you later. And they're just getting there. So they are That's wild. getting rid of this problem that they had with, you know, the unsavory types, which I'm sure most of them are probably honestly innocent since it's, it's China, shipping them over to Namibia to build all this infrastructure. And now Namibia is like a pretty freaking nice country. Like when we were in some of the cities, I'm like, this is like Southern California. Like it's, it's sick. Nice. Yeah. And they got like breweries, like on the beach, like it's not what you expect for Africa at all, but you're on the brink of a Mad Max desert. But then in all these neighborhoods are these like big fenced in areas where the Chinese live and in the ghettos, the, the ghettos, honestly. And they, the Chinese people are not supposed to leave those. Okay. They're like the workers yeah. to the point that we had a guy that was in our group though, shopping that was from Korea. He was like walking around by himself and he got stopped by secu- by police. And we're like, Hey, we need to see your papers. Like, who are you? And he had to show that he wow. wasn't a Chinese national. Dang. So like, it's pretty hardcore, dude. <laughs> Well, I guess we'll never be getting airtime over in China now that you just said all that. <laughs> Damn it. There's, there's Thanks, two billion people that are going to miss out. Miss it out. Wow. Anyways, that that's that's my world history lesson for the day. But uh, yeah, so back into real estate, though. These, uh, I forgot I'm a frick where I was going to go with all that sort of stuff. We were popping things off yep. in foreign countries yep. from foreign countries. That's right. Yeah. We're also like getting ready to crush some more hiring. So we've been st- continuous growth there, which is cool. We have. Yeah. So we have we have several different positions that we are hiring for right now. If you're interested in working with us, you should shoot me a DM on Instagram at Mike underscore invest. Here's the funny thing. I actually posted our different positions that we're hiring for on Instagram. Something that I've discovered is if you have a general platform, even if it's somewhat small, like, you know, this is an incredibly yeah. nice show. People want to work for you, apparently. We've had so much right. interest in various things. I should discourage you, though. If you are of interest, you should still reach out because we're going to be hiring for the next little while. But yeah, we're looking for sales guys, we're looking for some data folks inside. We're looking for some admins for various things. And then we're looking client for yeah, some client managers for our partnership program that we run in all these markets. And it's something that I've come to find as we're building this out, too is at least for me personally, this is a real estate investment show, the core of business is real estate investment. I have come to find that in my like soul, I'm not like a real estate investor. I love the entrepreneurial style of what we're doing right now. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more fun. That's what you find too with a lot of real estate investors. There's what I find, there's two types. There's people that just love it. They love real estate. Mm-hmm. They don't care about the business of it. They just love real estate and that's why they're running a business or there's people that just love the entrepreneurship and real estate is like a mini business. If you buy a rental property, you're a little entrepreneur, right? Mm-hmm. And now you can scale that as big as you want and become a business owner. I'm with you on that. I like that entrepreneurial, that aspect of running a business, building the systems and processes and all that. Yeah. It's a lot more fun once you sort of, I guess we've reached a point where we have the means to actually put resources into that, right? Which makes sure. it a little bit easier from when you're starting out. And, you know, I think something like a, being a self hustler as like a real estate wholesaler is a great way to get started. So you can make a huge amount of income as like a one or two man operation, but scaling that business without proper entrepreneurial structure is impossible. It's challenging to say the least. It is. Yeah. And as we have made that transition, it's funny as we've, it's kind of like a couple of different ways you can go. So we have started to go with like the large scale wholesaling, what the different partnership programs are doing on these different sort of things to scale our business. 
a lot of other people, what they do is they transition to like larger assets, right? That's how they make more money is mm -hmm. it's a higher cost per acquisition, but then the deals are much larger. And we toyed with that for a while and we still do sometimes. And most people that we talk to through like go on and things like that, they're like, when are you going to start buying apartment complexes? Okay. And I've come to find that for me personally, I honestly don't care to do that. Like, it's just not exciting to me. The ROI doesn't make it any better, right? No, it doesn't. You know, like, like I guess it can because it's a higher number at the end of it. But like the cash on cash at the race money, all those other things. But to me, it feels like we're starting over again with being like when we were first starting to wholesale, we didn't have any money and we were having to yeah. go and like, walk the Get hustle. Yeah, walk the pavement, like do the whole thing and like be poor for a while, yeah. right? Before we figured it out versus I feel like scaling the wholesale business, we can actually apply our resources to it and start to scale it more effectively than if we start with a new asset class. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to pivot. That's it's like almost like a whole new business model. It is. And I go back and forth because like there are some conveniences with commercial real estate in general, that residential, like small residential, like single family homes, a small multifamily don't provide like conveniences is in one roof. Uh -huh. There's more zeros behind the deal. So what I mean by that is like, you could buy a $100,000 house. And if that grows by 10%, you just made 10 grand. If you buy a million dollar commercial building, you just made 100 grand on the exact same ROI. So like, not that the ROI is any better, but you're making more money. Yeah. Right? And so there's some conveniences within that stepping in that space, but it's a lot of work. And then with that, the deal flow is typically less than you're going to see on the smaller number of things. So it's more likely that you can do 10 single family homes before you can do one commercial deal. Yeah, for sure. And, and I don't know, ultimately for me, like that just isn't that exciting. Like, like the, the monetary gains are what's interesting right? As it is for everybody. But the actual process of going through and having to underwrite an apartment and having to like, you know, stand up management and doing all these things, I'm like, oh my God, I really don't. I don't that, <laughs> it doesn't get you excited. It doesn't get me excited, yeah. honestly. Yeah. But like what we're doing, we're trying to grow this and we are, you know, doing these partnerships with all these different people. And we are building like a service and a process and things like that, that has big picture significantly more upside than a bunch of apartment complexes. We can't utilize things like debt quite as much, but if you look at the actual cash flow and value potential, plus also we're helping people, we're building business relationships that are deeper than just like, hey, look, let's like buy this apartment together and pretend like we actually care about each other. <laughs> and and that is, I think, just a lot more fun, but that's my view. It is. It's just a lot. It's also a lot more challenging in different challenges. It's not necessarily rinse and repeat every day. There's something new you got to tackle. There seems to be endless business processes or business challenges that you have to overcome with anything, but which is fun and does feel more entrepreneurial than anything. It feels like you grow in a business as opposed to fixing a toilet. Yeah, right. And I also like it too, because it's like actually solving a problem. You know, like, like realistically, what a lot of the apartment buyers do is they buy a place that has like a little bit of meat left on the bone. They squeeze out a little bit more and then they sell it to the next sucker until find there's nothing left. That's why the cap rates keep getting smaller and everything right? Because they're all, it's, it is almost like forced growth on it. And I find like when it comes to real estate, as the numbers, you know, making money is important. This is the same reason I don't really like Airbnb, right? As like, as like a general core model where these people are just buying these Airbnb properties throughout like cities where people live. Mm -hmm. If anything, you're kind of like creating more of a problem. If you look at a big picture, like when they're doing a lot of these gentrifications and things like that on these different apartment complexes, all it's doing is squeezing right. the population there tighter and tighter and tighter. Providing less, you mean like it's providing less and less affordable housing? It is, exactly. Yeah, it's providing less affordable right. housing. It's taking opportunities off the market for people if you're doing Airbnb. Taking these, especially because no one wants, no one wants like war zone properties. Very, very few people are, are going into these places that have like really like D class places and making them nice or even like C class. But everyone's like, I want B class, mostly turnkey apartment complexes that I'm going to go and turn into A class apartment complexes. So no, sure. Since yeah. now what happens is with that, the middle class, which is, you know, now up to a hundred thousand dollars a year, I think for a lot of, you know, a lot of markets, right. Especially if they're nicer markets. It starts at like, I don't remember 50 to 140. Yeah. It's just a wide range, but depending on where you live. Which is crazy, right? So you have people that are doing everything right. They now have to make a choice because that apartment complex they were going to live in and the new town is fully gentrified. They either have to exceed, overextend themselves to live in the decent part of town or they have to settle and live in like the shittier part of town that's like more dangerous and has all these other problems. And 
ultimately it just creates a larger issue that sure, you know, people that are involved in it make their money, which makes sense. I fully respect that, but I don't know. Maybe this is just me being holier than thou. I just don't really like that. Yeah, this socioeconomic conversation is boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But I know. I mean, you are creating the problem as well, Mike. Just to know. I mean, like, we buy shithole houses, dude. Me too. We, like, we're not, we're, we're not buying, like, the, the carpet paint flip for the most part. I would love to buy those. I know. Trust me, man. We don't get those shots. We only buy yeah. crack houses for the most part. We do. We We <laughs> truly... Which you could argue we're gentrifying the neighborhood, but we're not really in most of where we're going. Honestly, we're just like making sure the house doesn't look like a freaking pile of crap, which we have plenty of those here in Spokane that you're just like, oh, yeah. But that at least you know? gives an outcome that is beneficial to like the general population and not just like that. Like you and I, like a lot of we have kind of a unique perspective because I both hate the government and don't always disagree with them on some of the affordable housing and some of the stuff because like there are some, and anybody that listens to this, you can drive around your hometown and find these landlords. They're just idiots. They just uh-huh. let, they allow people to live in squalor. And yeah, it's up to those people to choose to live there. But also just some of the crap these landlords do when we walk properties from tired landlords. And you're just like, are you kidding me? Like, that's what you did. Like, this is not even safe. Like, you just like nailed a piece of wire to the wall and hooked a light bulb to it. Like, really? <laughs> like, come on. You know, or just just weird crap. We're like, oh, the window broke. I'm just going to put a board over it. Like, that's not fair. Yeah. That's not what they're paying for. That one that you walked through yesterday that had the light that you could like piv- swivel over into the shower. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't even landlord. That, you know what? Those people are just dumb. That was, um, that was people, homeowners, DIY. That was the worst DIY I've ever seen in my life. Some of the stuff there, but, but for landlords, I walk enough of them or there's, and this is the other problem in these days, there's a lot of new landlords, like everybody Mm -hmm. in America seems to be a real estate investor these days. There's a lot of new landlords that they go and hire a contractor and don't realize that the contractor just screwed them and used really terrible materials, didn't install them properly. And weird after six months, it's falling apart. I mean, we just walked a whole package that we were looking at very seriously Aaron Spokane and the guy that bought him is like well to do like he has the money he has he put good money yeah super nice guy put great money into these like what I would say were were C class assets they turned into B ish class assets but the work quality was absolutely shit yeah it wasn't great in most of them yeah it's like how do you and it was only two years old less than that yeah it's like yeah you can't allow that. No. But you don't know what well, you don't know what you don't know. And, and a lot of people see the same thing. They say, oh, new LVP floor, the walls look white. But then you look a little closer, you know, and you're like, okay, it's like when you move into a new house. And like, if, if you've ever moved into houses like that you own, like you kind of, even me, who's an expert at walking properties, like after about six months, I noticed, start noticing things. I'm like, I didn't notice that before. Like, oh my God, like that looks kind of like messed up. Like whether it's a brand new house or a house you you that somebody else lived in, you always see these things. Like, and then you can imagine when you're living or you're uh, owning a property that a fly-by-night contractor put together and you're seeing some of the stuff just fall off the cabinets, literally just falling off the walls. Yeah. It's like, oh my God. and then your tenants have to deal uh-huh. with that. And they're upset and they're calling you and you're like, well, I don't know what's going on with that. And you're spending, instead of 10%, on average, a month in maintenance, you're spending 20%. Yeah. Because everything's broken after you just put a bunch of capital into it. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge problem too, because that affects the value of your property as well. Like you're going to have to fix that. Yeah. Because people like us walking, we're like, no, we're not buying totally. it. Totally. And, 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 and also too, now that the market has cooled down, you can't be doing flips like that either anymore. You know, like people were getting away no. with that in 2021. Gross stuff. Like you do that this year and you're in big trouble. An inspector is going to go and just pick apart everything. So, and like, yeah, I don't know. You cut corners on weird stuff. That's what happens. Like I, I was under contract to buy this short-term rental down in Austin. And I, I dropped the contract this week. Like, A, because my sale that I was signed to in 10, 1031 and two had gotten pushed back because title companies are a freaking joke, you know? And they waited until the day before closing to let me know that they realized that there was a lien on the property that still hadn't been released from the previous owner like five years ago. Amazing, amazing title work. Yeah, they had 45 days to make sure that everything was good. And then day before closing, like, well, actually, we're going to delay you two weeks. And I could already see the writing on the wall that things might get pushed out even longer. So sure. I decided to drop the contract and not risk my $10,000 earnest money. But on that, on that deal, it's like a fully renovated house. They'd owned it for like two years. Place looked great, like it did. And a lot of the little stuff was really good with it, right? Like the general visuals were awesome, but there was just sure. little shit that they did. So for example, we found out that they had extended the driveway 
in the process of extending the driveway, whoever did it, they didn't like, I don't even know like how this was do it, but the sewer line. You just know it's wrong. I just know it's wrong. The sewer line got <laughs> yeah. crushed underneath the driveway. Oh no. Right? Underneath the new driveway. And so what the inspector guessed happened was that they went in, they knew that the sewer line was there. They didn't actually like put anything underneath it to like give it a support, right? So it was kind of sitting on like sand. And basically when they put the cement on top of it, it just like crushed it down into like a, like a particular spot where it was like super flat and it had a big bellow in it. it must have been like a shallow sewer line. because Yeah, like, a couple feet. So it wasn't, it wasn't very deep. Oh yeah, yeah, that's problematic. They might've even like dug into it when they were replacing some of the dirt with like gravel for the concrete. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. But just like they cut in corners, like right there like yeah. that. Or like for or another thing that in that house, they went through and they rewired a shit ton of the house. Mm, I love those ones. And it was good. Like it was all done by an electrician, quote unquote. But in the parts they didn't rewire that they just like sort of left there, it had like old shitty aluminum wiring. Oh, that's not good. That wasn't like like correctly tied to the rest of the system. So not only mm-hmm. would it, was it aluminum wiring, but like the way that it was tied to the breakers didn't make any sense. So essentially you yeah. would have like an outlet in like one room that was a different breaker than like the rest of the room, right? Because they just like did like some fuckery with it and they didn't do it right. Yeah. I'm like, they, they, so what they probably <laughs> did likely, and you know who else has a little, or where else you find aluminum wiring commonly? No. Trailers. <laughs> <laughs> the trailers you do. It was a common, we don't see it a lot up here in the Northwest, but there's there's other parts of the country because aluminum was cheaper. What you see is they, especially depending on when it was initially built, people trying to cut costs. Mm. And so the way that they would wire things is they would be like, well, I'm going to use the least amount of wiring possible. And so with that, you have weird things like just not like necessarily bad, but weird things like you're saying like, oh, this outlet in this room is actually attached to the breaker for the other room which is because it was the shortest way to connect that outlet to the circuit breaker. And so then they saved maybe like six feet of wire. Mm. And back then when they were building it, if wire was expensive, why they're using, like copper was expensive, that's why they're using aluminum. They're probably trying to cut every corner possible. Yeah, Not necessarily bad, but they're just, it's not ideal for the homeowner. Yeah, because it has a much higher fire risk, right? Is like the big thing. Some of it, well, aluminum definitely has a higher fire risk because it's, the rating on it is so much lower than copper. Yeah, right. And then with modern electronics, you plug a bunch of things in and that, you know, aluminum wire is not just good. cause issues. So yeah, if you don't have to mess with it, you shouldn't mess with it. Yeah. Hence canceling your contract. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, in this market where you have options. Yeah. Then that's exactly the point I'm making is I have options. I have tons of other stuff I can go look for. I'm like, I'm not going to clean up their mess, you know, yeah. especially I, I kind of feel bad. They're definitely losing their ass on the property. So that was, 100% their version of the property that we had where we lost like 50 grand on still hurts. about a month ago, which sucks. But like I looked at the history of it, when they bought it, the total work that they did on it, all these sort of things. I'm like, oh yeah, they're, they're definitely getting wrecked like horribly. They they originally had it listed at like $899 and I got it at $725. <laughs> that's awesome though. Well, that's, so that's awesome. what I had it for now. It's, now it's on back of the market. So yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do have a couple of topics that we need to cover today. I'm, out, I, uh, um, I'm sure that we need to cover them whenever, whatever yes, pop culture um, you've been reading up on. Dan's uh, pop corner. Is that what we should call it? The pop corner. Like from Costco, like the chips. So one of them is funny because it reminded me when we were talking about hiring, I wanted to bring this up. Yeah. It's, it's actually pretty funny and speaks to kind of like the anti-corporate culture of our company as well, like how we do things. I'll say, uh-oh, where are you going with this? Well, Elon Musk, I don't know if anybody okay. follows him on Twitter, but I do. And <laughs> like, there's this employee of his, or employee at Twitter that posted on Twitter. He said, nine days ago, the access to my work computer was cut along with about 200 other Twitter employees, blah, blah, blah. However, HR doesn't know if I'm an active employee or not. And, and Elon, and, uh, Elon Musk is like, what were you working on? Like, he literally replies to this, this tweet. And he says something about confidence. He's like, well, I would have to bring confidentiality. So maybe your lawyers can something, something. And Elon Musk just writes, it's approved. (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) Like he's having this Twitter conversation with the guy, right? And then the guy goes down and says, well, I've been doing these things, blah, blah, blah. And Elon Musk is like, take a photo. It doesn't count without a photo. Like, like just kind of trolling this guy, but also like, shut the hell up. Like who are, you know, like, and then people get all over like, oh, he's such a bad person. But then he follows up with his own Twitter post. That is, the reality is that this guy who is independently wealthy, so he's a, a rich dude, is actually done no actual work for Twitter and he has claimed it's because he's disabled. Uh, so he can't do work for Twitter. 
and that he's basically one of these guys that he's a serial, I don't know what you'd call it, like employment, like he's litigious. So he tries to get jobs at places where he can sue and come up with excuses. And so that's why he's independently wealthy. So Elon knew this dude's background, right? Uh-huh. Before he responded to it. But I just thought it was kind of hilarious, like that he's doing this on Twitter, just like crushing people. Yeah, because it's, it's very polarizing. But it also speaks to like, I think he has somewhat of an anti- corporate culture and recognizes that which he's actually also leading the charge in the tech industry because he had all these layoffs with Twitter and you know everybody's like oh my god he came in and he just laid off all these people well, guess what happened immediately after that everyone asked all him. the other tech companies are laying off tens and tens of thousands of people and they the word on the street is that Elon Musk basically empowered all these CEOs like Mark Zuckerberg who's like limp wristed just like oh I don't want to lay off my employees and when he laid them off he's like well we're not technically going to lay you off or this is it, we're definitely not laying more people off. And then like two weeks later, he lays off a whole nother 10,000 people. Like just this weird culture within Silicon Valley. And he's like leading the charge to change that basically. It's because they're a bunch of nerds, dude, who like start these huge yeah. companies. They like were coding something in their mom's garage. And then they're like, oh shit, right. I, I have a billion dollar company now. Well, it's it's fascinating though too, because I don't know that it used to be like that. Like you think of startup culture, which is like work around the clock even if you're a nerd, right? Yeah. Like that's that culture was in Silicon Valley. But like things have changed and there's a whole bunch of really fascinating topics on this uh, when it talks about why it got to that and like why people are getting paid so much and like how, like stock compensation, one of the reasons why people are doing that is because that is a non p item. So they're hiding compensation on the balance sheet so that their EBITDA looked better. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, it's all about stock valuations, right? All about stock See, value. it's just freaking, that the whole thing's crazy. And intentional consequences. Yeah. That's all I'm saying with that. But it, I just thought this was funny. So if you do come work for us, you know, we probably won't have a Twitter battle with you, but like we also won't need to because that's not our company culture. Well, the funny <laughs> thing is, is like what he's doing, I feel like it is polarizing, but people who are business owners, like typically they're like, oh yeah, I totally get where he's coming from. Because we've all dealt with that person. Even if it's not within your own company, everyone had their own coworker in their corporate workplace. You're like, that's like fucking... I don't know. I don't want to say a name because someone's going to come a name that I'm going to flame. But, <laughs> but you know, there's the, the everyone has been around that person in the corporate workplace before, and you're like that fucking guy didn't right. do anything the whole time yeah, he was nobody here. Nobody likes that person, no matter what. But they're always super opinionated yeah. about the company. They're always yeah. super against. Oh. I mean, yeah, we've all been there. I mean, I mean, I remember especially when I was at Boeing, the people that were the most into the Boeing culture and like they hated it. They would always have, they were so involved in the union. They like hated the yeah. C-suite. They didn't yeah. do dick ever. Yeah. They did yeah. nothing. Absolutely. And here's my opinion on that. It's like, you know what? The corporate culture is able to foster you to not do anything and they're going to still pay you. Yeah. That's not your problem. But you do not need to whine and bitch about it because you're doing nothing for a pretty <laughs> sweet paycheck. I know. Yeah. Well, and the thing <laughs> is, the reason people do that is because they're so dissatisfied with their life. Yeah. Right. 100%. And that is, you know, and that is a personal problem. Right. But that is also why things like real estate are here where you can come and you can make that jump and you don't have to be that person anymore. Yeah, 100 percent. And that real estate has been helping for decades to get people financially free. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think that's actually a reason there's a huge crossover. We we see this all the time with people that have like been interviewed on this show or just like interviews I hear on other shows engineers that get into a corporate gig at like a pretty cool company and they're like, this sucks. And then they get into real estate investing. Wonder why? Because engineering isn't that cool. No, it's the worst job, especially now that everything is so processized and there's so many regulations and things like that. Like like when I first got, you know, when we were at school, I got my electrical engineering degree. I kind of like had this thing. I was like, I'm going to be like out there like inventing stuff, you know? Some people, design shit. No, you're, you're a glorified no, you're project manager. You cut and paste things. Yeah. Like you don't really do anything as an engineer. And that's coming from, you know, a couple guys who worked in several different aspects of engineering and it's not really that No, cool. I worked at five different companies in my five years. Like I've seen the full <laughs> gambit. I've worked at everything from a company yeah. that was eight people that was doing like, you know, consulting to Boeing, which was like 50,000 people right. and everything in right. between. And all those roles, yeah, it's terrible terrible industry to get into. So freaking boring unless you're a paper pusher or you just like love the... Unless you like that. Unless you like that. Some people love that type of job. They thrive in the in the framework of that job. Yeah. They thrive in knowing what they're going to do every day. And the generally in engineering, the slow pace of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And people eat it up, right? That's cool. That's that's all them. But if you're like most people and you don't like that, 
you get into it, but you still have like the mindset around, you know, you understand numbers, you understand like the mm-hmm. strategy about how to put together a general process, but you want more. Real estate is like the perfect transition. You're absolutely right. It is. Even as we have come and gotten into this business, people have asked me regularly, how are you able to sort of like figure this out so quickly? It's like, well, I took my product sort of background, like my product, my process size background of doing engineering projects, just put that towards marketing and analyzing rental properties and flips and things like that. And it's kind of one-to-one, like the general mindset that you need is super, super similar. For sure. It's very helpful. It is. I think that's why there's a huge crossover of people that make that switch. But because, you know, it's ultimately this whole business is just determining patterns and getting a process in place and learning how to run a budget and then doing that consistently over time. I got one more thing I want to get your opinion on. Yeah. This is something I've noticed the last couple of weeks. Last couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. And I, so I followed two, I think only two uh, that I follow prominent female Uh-oh. influencers in the real estate space. I don't know if I should name them or not, but yeah, like, you, we can get down you, that I know you're going to say, you're going to say it's Cody, Cody Sanchez. Cody Sanchez. And Investor Girl and Investor Brit. Brit. They're who everybody in real estate follows because they're, it's shockingly hard to find prominent female. They're badasses, like hands down. Like, and that's why I follow them. Like, I just think they're super awesome. They've both started from scratch and, and built freaking empires. Uh-huh. Like Cody Sanchez is an entrepreneur and her whole thing is, is buying small businesses, right? I feel like she's like the Alex, the female version of Alex Ramosi or Alex Ramosi is the male version of her, whichever, like however you want to say that, like, because they're both kind of in that Alex Ramosi has acquisitions.com. She has her whole mastermind group. And that's her big thing of like buying businesses, growing them and selling them. Investor Girl Brit, real estate. Her thing was starting off doing videos of herself rehabbing her single family homes. And now she's like this freaking powerhouse doing self storage and all that sort of stuff. Awesome. But I have followed for a long time. And then recently I noticed that some of their posts, they would post like, them talking about storage units, but in a bikini or talking about buying a business in a bikini. I'm like, why do you need that? Like, why are you doing that? Right? Obviously, it's for more clicks, Uh more influence, more followers. And then it made me start thinking, I'm like, is that their problem? Like, is that a problem? And I was like, well, not really. I mean, first of all, I'm like, I don't care what you post. Like, if you like it, if you want, if you have like a nice fit body you're proud of, flaunt to do whatever, it doesn't bother me one bit. But then the other part is, is I was like, is the internet just driven by a bunch of dudes who need to see that uh-huh. in order to follow people? Is yes. that like, is the internet broken or is that how the internet exists or why the internet exists? It's just dudes needing to see women in bikinis. I mean, even beyond that, right? Like it's a, it's a general society and internet issue. And I think it's really sad that they have the need to do that, right? Like it's sad, but here's one advantage though. You and I cannot take a shirtless picture and get a bump in influence. You and me can't, because we're not fucking shredded. If we, <laughs> like, <laughs> That's true. Okay. Yeah, if we yeah. were like 3% body fat, we probably could. Maybe, yeah. Because there's, there's dudes point, that yeah. are out there, like even our even our business coach right now, Steve Rosenberg, he's like yeah, 50, he's, he's jacked. Stud. Like that is part of his brand. With the with females in this, I mean, that kind of sexualization, I uh, imagine that they, if you went and asked them if that was like three years ago when they started this, like, oh yeah, you're going to be talking about business and then you're going to have to start doing a bikini to continue to get more followers. They would have been like, fuck no, that's ridiculous. Right. I would, I would assume, again, I don't know them. I would just make that assumption. But I guarantee you that, I mean, they have media teams. There was a conversation around putting that piece of material together. And ultimately right. what it does is it does get eyes, right? Regardless of you, you're going through, you're going through Instagram, how Instagram algorithm works, not only just what you engage with, but it's also what you pause on. You go through, you mm. see a female in a bikini, Men or women that are interested women in women, too. women too. Anybody, That's right? true. They are going to pause on that because it stands out. And now you are going to get exposed to more of their content, right? On a regular basis. It is a business decision. That's fascinating. Honestly. It is like, you know, and, and that's just the reality of it. Is it weird? Sure. Is it necessary? It shouldn't be, but it is like, that's just the nature of how marketing works, especially when you're trying to be a personal brand. There's a reason that like some of these Twitch streamers and things like that, like they get start to get big and they go and start like an OnlyFans and they do all these things. They're making like million dollars a month, some of these women, yeah. right? Because and, and I guarantee you that when they first started streaming on Twitch, they were like, oh, I'm going to like play games on the internet. This is cool. And then they're in like a hot tub. And then the people are like, hey, send me pictures of your feet. And they're like, cool, I'm going to start this thing. And they That's pay ridiculous money. And it odd. should it should not be that way. But unfortunately, that is the state of humanity right now. Man, it reminds me of idiocracy. Uh, Honestly. (laughs) 
right? Dude, that <laughs> movie, so yeah. ahead of its time, so shockingly relevant. And every decade goes by, it gets even more relevant. Dude, it's, <laughs> it's so bad. Like, I don't know. We sh- I should go rewatch that and just like, we should do, here's what we should do. We're going to do, we should do a collecting keys idiocracy watch, like a reaction. <laughs> Together reaction. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the podcasters do. Go watch a movie and then like you talk about, we can make it YouTube content. <laughs> That'd probably be a terrible YouTube video. Yeah, it would. Especially because we get bored halfway through and we'd be like, well, like every, every like four minutes, we'd have to be taking phone calls because we're trying to close right. deals and stuff. Seriously. <laughs> Anyhow, sorry to take us down that rabbit hole. I just wanted to say that, express that as, as influencers out there to see what your thought was because I just caught my eye. Maybe, I, and I thought for a second, maybe I was the only one that noticed that. I mean, minus the millions of followers. Yeah, well, it's all about getting followers at the end of it, you know? So, I don't know. If I was in that position, I'd do the same thing. That's all I know. 100%. I'm yeah, on board. Yeah. Like, that's how you got to do it. You got to do it. So, cool. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening to this show, this uh, episode of the Mike and Dan Show. It's a couple quick reminders. Go to store.clickkeyspodcast.com to check out uh-huh. our new merch store. There's going to be like two things on there right now. And uh, we'll add stuff periodically. We'll always let you know when we come up with a new design. We're not going to have like 50 things because that's on our brand. Our goal is that there's like the niche shirts that when we have keys con or some whatever thing here in like the next couple of years that everyone can show up and be like, oh, you got the BDE shirt. You got whatever. And <laughs> I'll be the only one wearing the BDE shirt. No, nah, no. Nah, <laughs> It'll be real weird with me wearing There, There will be a couple of wearing them. So, uh, you know, go check that out. Store.collectingkeyspodcast.com. Aside from that, guys, if you want to start generating off-market leads, you should go to collectingkeyspodcast.com slash free. You can get our free five-step guide to getting off-market deals. And then if you want to work for us, hit me up on Instagram at Mike underscore invest, or you can hit up Dan at InvestorMain. Dan, go and shoot us a DM, shoot us a follow. Let me know if you're interested in a potential employment opportunity because we are hiring people pretty aggressively. And uh, I'd love to hear what you can do. So, Awesome, guys. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you all next week. See you.